Hi everybody, it's Sarah Cray and I teach watercolor and today we are doing our hidden garden project. The hidden garden. The hidden garden. Not related to the secret garden. <laughs> Which is a great movie. Which is a great movie and book. We have Michael here working the cameras. Hello. And we're married so I might call him like dear whatever and don't be weirded out by that. And we will be doing this project in five steps. So our very first step, oh there's so much, there we go. Our very first step is we are actually going to sketch. There is no outline with this, but don't stress. I know that you guys can do this. Our second step is we are gonna put in our very, like the background. So like the sky and these greeneries here. Our third step is we are going to put in these like leaves over top and the pathway. Our fourth step is we will put in our fence and our gate. And our fifth step is the shadows. It's also helpful for you guys to have a pencil to draw with. And I also grabbed some salt just for some fun texture in the background. Um, so if you have some salt handy, that's great. I'm using all four of my paint brushes, my round two, my round six, my round 12, and my one inch wash. Please do not let your lack of brushes stop you from painting. Use what you have. As my grandma used to say, there's more than one way to skin a cat. And there is more than one, way, one paintbrush you can use for a project. Use your fingers. I had paintbrush. There we go. <laughs> um, I'm using five colors today. I already have them swatched here. So our very first color is lemon yellow. Our second color is honey brown. Our third color is red. Our fourth color is Tahoe blue. And our last color is Payne's gray. I have a piece of watercolor paper that I cut in half. And then I taped it off using my Holbein soft tape, which is my favorite tape. Got my pencil, got my water. I'm ready to go. Shimmy, shimmy. Shimmy, shimmy. Let's get to it. Let's do our oath and then we will start. Okay, everyone raise the right hand right. and repeat after me. I promise to be kind to myself. I promise to be kind to myself. I promise not to compare my work. I promise not to compare my work. And I promise to have fun. And I promise to have fun. I was off time. You were really off on that one. That's okay. All right, so grab your pencil and we are going to do a light sketch. And you might say, but Sarah, I've never drawn before. That's okay, we're just doing basic shapes. So the first thing that we are going to do is define our horizon. So our horizon line, I'm gonna put it at about two thirds of the way to the top. So I'm just gonna boop, 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 okay? Listen, I don't think my bell was off. I think you don't understand my art, my bell art. We need more bell. More cow, more. More cow, cow bell, bell. more yellow bell, more oath bell. <laughs> okay, horizon line here, then my pencil. I'm gonna put in the pathway. So I have to think about this pathway starting and kind of curving. So I'm actually just gonna do a curved line like that. And it can be more curved, less curved. It's gonna be in the background, so it's not like crazy, okay? And then I want to put in my fence. So my fence is gonna come like here. And you can just do a horizontal line if you want. I'm gonna have it end about here and let's have it be maybe about an inch and a half away from the bottom. Okay. And if you wanna darken some areas to like make sure. And then our leaves are gonna be like this, but blah, blah, blah. you don't even have to draw that in if you don't want to. Okay. And then our actual gate is just gonna be, you don't have to sketch this in either, but it's just gonna be like these skinny lines, like that. And um, our shadows, so I'm gonna basically choose an angle, whatever angle you want. Um, I don't know, Michael, what would you say this angle is? I, I can't really see, that's like a 45. 45. So I'm gonna do like a 45 degree angle and just know that the shadows on everything else, once you define it, need to also be that same angle. So here, 45. These gates, 45. Unless you live on a planet with two suns. Planet with two suns or depending on where the sun is, but in this, it's fine. 45 is what we're going for. And I want to acknowledge one thing, which is while we're painting this, it is going to look so weird until we put in the shadows, which is the very last step. And I promise you that the shadows is what makes this painting. Okay, so when we put in the fence, when we put in the path, you're gonna be like, what's even happening? This doesn't even look great. 
The shadows make this painting. So please hang on to that very last step. Trust the process. Trust the process. Okay, we ready to go? So I'm gonna start by putting in like the background sky and this background like, I'm gonna do like greenery areas here. Now, please keep in mind, this is gonna be fuzzy, out of focus. We're not entirely sure what's going on. So allow yourself to play, okay? So I'm gonna mix a desaturated blue with a light value. So I'm gonna take some Tahoe blue. I'm using my round 12. Let's grab a little bit of honey. Let's grab more blue because that's too green. A little bit more blue, a little bit more blue, a little bit of paints. Let's see what color we end up with. Yeah, that's a good color. What color is that? Ooh, this is like, it looks like a, like a seafoam color to me. Seafoam, good call. Okay, so if you want it even more, like that might still be too saturated, so add a little bit more water to it, and if you want to gray it down, you can add more Payne's gray. Or it can be a vibrant blue. Just make sure it's a light value, a barely there color, okay? So I'm gonna take this and um, I'm just gonna paint the sky. I'm gonna overlap the horizon a little bit. And you can have this color go all the way to the top. So just horizontal strokes using that. And then I'm gonna put in like the hint of like mountains or something in the distance. I'm gonna use that same blue color, but just pick up a tiny bit more of it. And then you can like drop that in and do like, oh, here's a hill in the distance. So it's just like the hint of something there, okay? Now, just working continuously, I'm going to do this green grass area. So I have some green here. And let's add a little bit of Payne's green, a little bit of honey brown. Again, we want this to be an overall light value. I'm just gonna drop that in. And because we're putting it into a wet, both, both like that faraway mountain and this grassy area, it's gonna bleed because we're putting it into a wet um, surface and that is okay. That's what we want. And then along this bottom here, that's where I'm gonna grab a little bit more green and just kind of follow that edge. And remember, we're just gonna let it bleed out. Okay. And this is where you can add some salt if you want some of that texture. Just for fun. Okay, now we're gonna let that dry. So step two, no, that was step two. Step three is putting in our leaves and our pathway here. So <clears throat> when we put in our leaves, we want to do a hue change. Hue refers to the color. Value refers to the lightness and darkness of a single color. And hue is just, so, we're, so what we're going for here is we're going for, a, we're doing a value and a hue change. So we're starting with dark green along the edges. As we move our way towards the middle, we're gonna to move to a regular green, a light green, and then yellow. And that's because we really want to highlight the fact that there is light coming in through those leaves. And by just changing the hue and the values, we're getting a sense of dimension and form. If I were to do this whole thing in one green color, it, it would feel just flat like just a flat thing. And then this way, it kind of feels like it's growing, like maybe there's a little bit of roundness or movement to it, okay? I'm gonna put the pathway in first because my top area is still wet. So I'm going for kind of like a tan brown color. I'm gonna use my 12, but you can use a different size brush if you want. Let's grab some honey brown. And let's grab some Payne's Gray and let's just see where we end up with that mixture. I'm gonna grab some red to tone down the green. And 
Now this is too purple. You see that? The opposite of purple is yellow. So I'm just gonna grab more honey. There we go. That's a nice brown color. Maybe I'll do a slightly, like let it be more yellow because my fence is gonna be like a good brown and I want those to feel like separate areas. And I'm gonna add water to it because I want this to be a light value, okay? So I'm just gonna do horizontal brush strokes. You can overlap the fence if you want. And then I'm just gonna fill in. You don't have to do like the whole area, but basically just whatever is gonna be seen through our gate, we wanna make sure that we actually see it. And if you want a little bit of extra like texture and oomph, you can do the dry brush texture for the dirt. So I'm gonna take my 12, pick up some paint, let the paper towel absorb the extra paint, and then just whoosh. Now, before I put in my leaves, whenever you do landscape paintings like this, you wanna always approach it back to front. That just like makes it much easier to tell these layers of planes that we're painting. And so before you move on to the next like plane, you wanna feel good about what you put down before because you wanna try to avoid working backwards um, or going back to the previous step. Now I'm looking at my greenery and I love this kind of like color and edge that I got. I think that's beautiful. I do, however, want to darken this a tiny bit, not a ton, um, but enough to where there's a little bit more range of value. Now, the reason why we don't wanna make it super dark is because when you're trying to communicate space and depth in a landscape, you wanna think about atmospheric perspective, which is this rule that the farther something is away from us, it tends to lighten in value and even out in value, which means that yes, we'll put a little bit of like medium value here, but I'm not gonna do the darkest value because that should be in our foreground. Our foreground or what's in front of us is going to be the most contrast and we'll have the fullest range of value. Does that make sense? So I do want to do like, like maybe just darken it a little bit and it has dried, but that's okay. Just kind of defining it. But again, I'm not going for like a super dark green because my, my foreground is reserved for my darkest value. And then if you wanna add a little bit of like flowers, like let's say this is a little rose garden, you can grab some red. It's not gonna be a vibrant red because it's being painted on green, but it will give you some color. It is funny, it's like you said, I'm looking at this going, no way. <laughs> I know but you gotta trust me. Okay, so I feel good about that. Maybe a little bit of extra warmth in this area, a little extra vibrancy. There we go. Yes, I know it feels very like, what is this even going to be? I'm asking you just to trust me. Ooh, gosh, I love how that turned out. Shining, shimmering. That's a trust me reminds me of Aladdin. Oh, <laughs> well, it's a good movie. Okay, so now we're gonna do our leaves around, and I want you to mix all of your greens on your palette so then we can just get to painting. So my palette got a little messy here, but that's okay. I'm gonna take. I'm, I want a pile of dark green first, so I'm gonna take some Tahoe. I'm going to take some honey. There's a little bit of lemon in there too. I'm gonna grab some of this Payne's Gray. Even more Payne's Gray. Let's do more blue. There we go, yeah, look at that gorgeous dark green color. Okay. And then we also want like a good, just like warm, like regular green. Okay. And then we also want a very yellow green. And I'm just putting this on top of what's already here. I don't think that like this little bit of blue is gonna make a huge difference. So 
I have that ready. And then you are gonna want to have, and I'm not gonna put this on my palette yet, but you are gonna wanna have some like lemon with a tiny bit of honey ready to go because these leaves are gonna be that color, okay? So I'm gonna take my 12. I'm going to start with, let's actually start with this kind of medium green. And I'm just going to lift my brush and I want you to look at how all these weird marks that I'm making. So I'm putting it down, I'm angling it, I'm moving it around. And all that I'm trying to do is get inconsistent and very varied marks, okay? So I'm gonna work my way. And let's do it section by section just in case um, it takes you guys a bit to paint. So I'm gonna do the left-hand side and then while it's wet, I'm gonna take this dark green that I have mixed and ready to go and I'm gonna drop it in. You can either drop it in or just paint on top. It's gonna to have the same effect because it's wet. I'm just gonna diffuse out. Gotta mix some more, which is fine. My painting's not going anywhere. Famous last words. <laughs> so you can see that like that color, basically you just wanna make sure that the edges is where it stays darkest. Now, if you want there to be a clear separation of the medium and the dark, see how it kind of like evenly blended? You can wait for that green to dry and then put the dark marks on top. I'm gonna to do a mixture of both. But if you notice that your values and your colors are just evening out because we're doing too much wet on wet, then let it dry and then go back into it. So I'm gonna just keep going. This green, and now I'm gonna start, let's like start warming it up. So I can grab some yellow in there. And the reason why I'm moving my brush around in these crazy brush strokes is because if we do this mark over and over again, then it's like way more, how do I say it? There's no variation in our marks and variation in our marks just gives it a more realistic feel. Those marks are what are gonna separate you from the AI painting this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you worry about that? No. Nah. Okay, so as I'm kind of moving towards the center, um, our largest marks and our most like condensed color is gonna be along the edges. As we work our way to the middle, that's where our marks start to get smaller. So I'm going to kind of like let myself use the tip of my 12. And, oh, it mixed with another color. Let's grab some yellow. Start to kind of put in this warmth. I'm still not doing the tiniest ones yet. I'm still kind of just doing like that warm green portion. And you wanna think about where the top of your fence is and make sure that you're going a little bit past that. So go a little bit lower than maybe you need just to make sure that it overlaps how you want it to. Now I'm looking at kind of like the white spaces in between here and I need to mess some of them up because I want it to feel a little bit more full than what I painted. So it's important to have some there, but the size will give the viewer information of how many gaps there are, like how sparse it is. Okay. Then I can take more dark green around here. This kind of painting would be fun to do the same painting four times for the seasons. Ooh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yes, I do. And you can drop a little bit of like just blue here and there too. It always gives like such a beautiful new kind of green in there. OK. 
Okay, I'm gonna let that dry for a second before I put in the darkest, one more layer of the darkest value along the edge. And now I'm gonna grab my two. And you can use lemon yellow. It just, I like there to be a tiny bit of warmth in my like highlights. So you can do honey brown or even maybe a tiny, tiny bit of red in there. I'm gonna grab my two, mix like a warmer yellow, but I don't want it to be straight orange. I still want it to feel yellow. And then here is where we do our tiniest marks. So think about, think about tree branches and look, if you have some close to you, look at the edge of that and see if there's like a branch, like a single branch that sticks out, that kind of thing. That's what we're going for is just like these little hints. And this might be a little bit too orange, so I'm gonna grab some more just straight yellow. I'm sure Honey Brown would actually also do the trick too. Now, even with these smaller marks, you want to mix up their spacing, everything, because it that's what's going to make it feel more realistic. And you can see I'm not trying to paint like a leaf. I'm not like, oh, this is a perfect leaf. I'm really just doing small marks because when there's so many layers of these small things, we're not seeing an individual leaf laying flat, like how our brain tell us, tells us a leaf is. Most of the time it's angled or it's facing towards us or facing away from us. So those shapes are very different than how our brain is like, no, a leaf. So that's why it's okay to make some of these wonky marks because they're, they actually are wonky, you know? Okay, that feels good. And then I'm gonna dry this. And you wanna mix the darkest green you can, even if it's almost black. And then if your thing is dry or mostly dry, we can do one more layer of that dark, just right here on these corners. I had a rogue piece of salt, did you see that? Concerning your uh, leaves and not painting them hyper detailed, I heard a quote that art is in what you leave out. Oh, interesting. And it applies to music and to painting, you know, it's the, you can make it as complicated and as reference type material as you want, but most of the time the like stylistic choices are what make the artist and the art. Yeah, totally. I like that. Okay. That looks a good. Okay. Now what I got to do is I need to mix a very beautiful brown and I love browns. I feel like brown is such an underrated color. Um, the problem is, is I got a lot of green going on and I don't want my browns to lean green. I want it to lean really like orange, warm, like more like orange. Will you show that paper towel to the camera? Oh yeah. How beautiful is it? It's perfect. Yeah. I just love those. All right, sorry. So whenever I'm, I have a lot of one color on my palette and I want to like move on to something new, um, I'll just take my paper towel that I was using and just wipe out an area. It doesn't have to be perfectly clean, but just kind of getting that excess paint out of there. And I know that y'all have plenty of paint, so. 
Okay. And then now I have a clean new corner to work with. I'm gonna use Honey Brown. I have some red there that I'll pull from and I have some Payne's Gray that I'll pull from. And I'm going to mix Honey, Red, Paints, and look at that brown. If it's still too green, add more red. If it's too red, you can add a tiny bit more, you can add a tiny bit of the blue. So uh, outside of the studio in your normal painting, you tend to use more of a ceramic glazed paint accessory tray. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that that works better or do you like the butcher tray better? Or are they about the same? Uh, they're about the same, honestly. Butcher trays are great um, because I love this huge mixing area that I get with them. Yeah. So that's why I really like to use them. Um, and I guess I'm a little bit embarrassed you asked me this question because the reality is sometimes I just like having very nice things to paint with. Yeah. And with watercolor, there's not a ton of materials. It's paint and brushes and paper. And so whenever I have the opportunity to splurge on an item to make it feel more special when I go to paint, um, I do. So that's why sometimes <clears throat> my personal work palettes are from makers and artists um, because it feels fun to go to a painting thing when you have this special item. Okay, so we're gonna get into our fence, which is step four. And I want you to pay attention to something here. I know that we drew out our fence, but it is common in art. Like, okay, let's say this is my curved line and here's my horizon and I'm gonna put a fence in. What I don't want is I do not want my fence to line up with any of these lines. We have to either make it taller or shorter because if I were to put my fence here, it's just like, oh, where is this line? Where is this plane? So there's a term for it. Gosh, I wish I would have looked it up before. But whenever you layer, you wanna make sure that the lines aren't matching up. Does that make sense? Yeah, like I'm upset. Yeah, so basically, even though I drew my end of the fence here, I feel like that's too close to this line. So I'm gonna raise it and I'm gonna move it to here, okay? And then that way it's super clear to the viewer, no, this is where our fence goes. It can even probably go a little bit taller if I want. Yeah, I'm gonna make it a little bit taller. So maybe move it up there. So basically you just wanna make sure it's not very close to this area. And if you have a strong mountain, mine kind of faded so it doesn't matter as much, but if you have a strong background that ends over here, you don't want your fence to line up with the top of that either, okay? You need to have those separate. Okay, so I'm gonna take my one inch wash and I'm going to start putting in my fences. So I'm just gonna start by doing the whole width of the one inch wash. And I'm not picking up a lot of water because I want this kind of rough texture. And then I'm gonna lift and leave a space in between. So I'm just kind of like initially putting this in. Okay. And you just wanna make sure that it lines up. Concerning what you said about splurging on the tray, I don't think that's negative. I actually listened to this guy talking about how to form a good habit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you consider, you know, a hobby or painting something a good habit, you have to incentivize your mind to like it. Mm -hmm. And so having the nice thing, it rewards you during the activity. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, I want to paint because I love my tray. And my closest analogy is I like you know, music and guitars, and it's the same thing. You like a, if you have a nice guitar, you, you want to play it more mm -hmm. than one that you have to fight all the time. It just makes it feel more special. So when you go to do this thing, that's why like, it's nice to kind of set up a routine or set up a space because yeah. then it feels like a treat when you go in there with your nice things and the music or maybe 
whatever you need. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, as I'm putting in, so I kind of put in my fence already, and then I'm going to use my 12 because I want my slats, is that the right word? Yeah. To be a little bit thinner than what my one inch wash could handle because this is a pretty thick. So I kind of like shaped it and then you can go in and it's okay if this is a smoother line. And then now I can decide how thick I want my slats to be. And I'm kind of following my guide that I made with the um, one inch wash. Now, please know that fences are in multiple stages of decay <laughs> and can be really old or um, all of that stuff. So it's okay if the slats end up a little bit wonky. Just leave a little bit of space in between on some of them to get that feeling of these are individual slats of wood. The thing in, uh, the thing about getting the nice gear, I feel like it's a slippery slope. And in the guitar community, they call it having gas, which stands for gear acquisition syndrome. Okay. And it becomes more about finding the best cute tray or mm -hmm. chasing the thing instead of like using it in your process. I think that's why I was embarrassed to say it because I don't want to create this narrative that you have to have the best of the best and the beautiful things and these like unique items to make good art. I mean, for years and years and years, I'm use, I was using Walmart, Walmart paper in a dinner plastic plate and whatever paints I can get my hand on hands on and that's how I painted and you can make beautiful paintings with that so I don't want you to feel like if your supplies aren't like top level that you can't make good art because I know that that is not true it's just for me because because now my job is painting and because I do have to paint in order to like provide for our family I need to buy me guitar yeah. <laughs> I need to think about what is sustainable enough for me to keep me going in this practice and having that special thing to look forward to, um, like does that for me. Okay. So I did that on the right hand side. Now I'm going to do that same thing on the left hand side. And if, if you are concerned about like how to make your fences straight, always make sure that you're looking at your painting straight on when you're doing your straight lines. Cause I like to paint like at the side, but then if you paint the whole time at the side, when you look at it straight on, you're like, oh shoot, that line is crooked. <laughs> um, so just kind of check yourself every once in a while and um, try and get it as straight as you can. But back to what you said, uh, the amount of straight fences I've seen in my life is far out wide. Yes. Yeah crooked fences I've seen in my life. And maybe this is like a hidden, like who knows how long it's been there and- The Romans built it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what order these come out in, but when we were talking about um, the watering can and about how metal rusting is essentially it burning very mm -hmm. slowly. Mm -hmm. That's why your fence, I mean, there's a myriad of reasons for wood. It's a little bit of a different material, but that's why your fences turn gray and they don't stay brown forever. Same thing. They're slowly burning in the oxygen. Oh, really? And they get oxygenized. Oxygenated? Oxygenized? I don't they ask me. I don't know. Bombarded with oxygen. <laughs> and then even like think about slats of wood and how like the top sometimes aren't like perfectly square. You know what I mean? Like. Okay. So allow you trying. Okay. Allow your fences to be wonky. I'm just kind of checking. Okay, that feels good. That feels really good. Okay, and then um, now we gotta do this slat that kind of goes across. Try and have a darker brown for that. Should it go, does it, should it go all the way to the edge? Sure. I don't know. I'm trying to think of like how to build a fence. Yeah, I'd make it go all the way. Okay. You drawing on your deep fence building. <laughs> <laughs> and these are just kind of like we're keeping it more gestural lines. It doesn't have to be anything super detailed. 
If you want it to feel a little bit more three-dimensional, have the middle of this slat be lighter and then the edges be a little bit darker. That kind of turned out a little bit too thick, but that's okay. Do you worry about the back details like of your grass and hills coming through the brown of the wood or does it wash away pretty well? I think that if you look for it, you can find it, but people aren't going to look for it. So like, can I see this line right here on my grass? Yes. And so if, if it's super strong in yours, what you can do is just do more dry brush on top on your wooden slats using a darker brown. Mm -hmm. And just kind of like, you just wanna mess up that line so then our brain doesn't know to look for it. Does that make sense? Gotcha. Okay. And I'm not gonna do a slat along the bottom. I just am not, okay? Great. All right, now what we're gonna do is we are going to use our round six and we are going to put in like our posts for this gate. This, I would say is gonna be the hardest part because trying to paint thin, even, straight, <laughs> iron is hard. So I just wanna say like embrace the wonkiness that's going to happen because if you look at mine, they are wonky and we're just gonna be okay with that. And then when I'm thinking about this fence, I also wanna pay attention to that same thing. Where is this going to end up the line kind of thing. So I'm actually gonna start it, my vertical or my horizontal line first. Mm, trying to decide where to put it. Maybe here, sure. And I'm just using Payne's Gray. Is that straight? I can't tell. Straight enough. That's. That's right, straight enough. That's our mantra. And I like to start out with thinner lines because if something is not straight, then you can just thicken it and straighten it out. Um, so start too thin at first, and then you can, that way you can make adjustments if you need to. So I put in my horizontal. I'm gonna do the same thing along the bottom. I am not a fan of rulers. They stress me out. Um, but if you wanna like make sure that you're doing like straight edges and stuff like that, feel free to use a ruler. Okay. And now the scary part, which is the vertical ones. So I just kinda like, we're doing this and I'm just gonna go for it. And it's okay if they kinda have a point to them or they can be square. Like iron comes in different shapes like that. You know what I mean? So I'm just going to, um, Go for it. So some of these I'm kind of adding a little bit of a point to. Now these ones you do want to try and get them evenly spaced. Maybe this needs like a hint of another one. Okay. They are not perfect, but that is okay. And then I'm just gonna darken some of them. Yeah, some of them got a little, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> is our gate that we added. Just kind of checking my lines. Okay, I'm gonna call that good. I feel like I want a little bit extra dry brush texture on some of my wood fence. Um, you can do as much or as little as you want. 
And then the next step is our very last step, which is putting in our shadows. So think about, check our outline from before to see if it's the same. And then on the areas where there's like, that, that's a pretty thick slat, like um, area in between. So I'm actually gonna draw that into my shadows. Okay, that one is continuous. There's a space there. And this needs to darken up here. Okay. And I'm gonna do my shadows for my gate. And then even this vertical line is gonna have a shadow. And then um, we'll put in some textures for the leaves themselves casting shadow. So you can use any brush size you want, whatever size you feel comfortable with. Grab some Payne's Gray, because we want this to be nice and dark. This is like our darkest value. Um, so I'm gonna add some more Payne's Gray. And you can mix a little bit of like brown in there if you want, if you don't want it to be that straight Payne's Gray color. And I'm just going to go for it. And remember the shadow is darkest right where it meets. So you can drop in a little extra paint. Same thing on this side. Already, I feel like the shadow is like, gosh, where it's at. You know what I mean? It's it. It's it. Okay, and then we got to do the shadows for these gates, which is also scary, but it's okay. We're just going to be like, I got this. Okay, but now we're going to do some leaf little textures. So think about these small marks that you guys made. And you can do it over on top too. Actually do a little bit more. And some of these shadows need to get a little bit closer. So I'm just gonna... You can also use, I just realized that probably using your round two might be a little bit easier if you're not as comfortable making small um, marks with your round 12. And there we go. Beautiful. That's our... That's the thing. That's the thing. I'm adding a little bit darker to here. Only if you need it. Yours might not need it. Can you guys tell that I just really love this dry brush texture? It's just <laughs> so fun. And there we go. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. We together have drawn and painted a shadowy garden. No outline. No outline. Training wheels are off. You guys did that by yourself. Like, that's amazing. So take a second and celebrate that because that's a great achievement. Um, and also utilize this process to go about a new painting. If you're doing landscapes, work back to front. Um, think about values. And remember that shadows are like light is um, extreme light in a painting always makes it look more dimensional because then your values can be really extreme, okay? Mm. Um, thank you so much for painting with me. Can't wait to see how yours turns out because this was free-handed and we mix our own colors. Everybody's is gonna turn out different. Um, so paint it, share your work. If you're on Facebook, you can um, join our Facebook watercolor group. That's called Let's Make Art Watercolor. 
And by sharing your paintings and letting other people see it and looking at other people's, it's just opportunity to learn and opportunity to connect. And if you are on Instagram, you can tag us at let's go make art, hashtag let's make art. And if you need any of these supplies, you can find them at letsmakeart.com. Thank you all so very much. See you later. Bye. Bye.